Jesse Zhang is a co-founder of Beacons.ai, a website builder for creators, and a Series A company backed by Andreessen Horowitz and the Chainsmokers. Jesse got his PhD in electrical engineering at Stanford University, where he was developing new methods for designing deep learning models for RNA sequencing. In this conversation, Jesse talks about why he decided to start a creator economy startup versus getting a high earning job as a deep learning engineer or, on, or a machine learning engineer. He's first two hard years at Beacons where they were dealing with a lot of co-founder conflicts and how that went down and his general perspective on struggles and challenges in life and a lot a lot more. Jesse is one of the most positive and optimistic friends and I really admire his sheer enthusiasm and ability to reframe any event. I really enjoyed this conversation and I really hope that you do too. Let's get started. Okay so you've been a founder for four years Yes. Have you always wanted to be a founder? No, actually, not really. I think uh, I had always been like kind of entrepreneurial through like high school and in college for a bit. My growing up, my mom was always like, "You should do business." Like, oh, whatever, okay. whatever the hell that meant. Um, but I always gravitated more towards like engineering slash STEM disciplines. So yeah, I don't think I woke up one day when I was in high school and was like, "I gotta yeah. be a founder one day." But I always kind of surrounded myself with it. Going to Stanford helped with that a lot. Being around people like Neil and David also helped. So you were really into STEM and I mean, you have a whole PhD in literally like mechanical yeah. engineering, but with electrical, the, engineering. electrical engineering, <laughs> yeah. but with an angle on machine learning, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. As um, applied to genomics, actually. So kind of far out from what I do yeah. now. Um, yeah, I guess I always gravitated towards like the STEM disciplines because it just made more sense to my brain. For some reason, like when I took English classes and history classes, I could never figure out like how to generate a good output before <laughs> before like the stem stuff there was i like how there was like a concrete answer right you have like a very logical sequence of steps um i liked breaking down problems through that kind of thinking and i don't know it just it just made sense to me yeah that resonated with me more so phd at stanford you have a lot of friends a bunch of close friends and two of yeah. your close friends and yourself decide to work on a startup because that's I guess what everyone yeah. at Stanford did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah what was the story was it literally just like okay the Silicon Valley narrative and dream is to build a company eventually did you guys kind of fall into that as well or what prompted the startup journey I think I did I, I'm not sure if I can speak for David or Neil or Greg um, I know Neil's wanted to do a startup for a very long time mm -hmm. like um Neil's a bit older than the rest of us because he did undergrad twice and Neil Caveat is the CEO of yes, the company. Yes, yeah. Neil is the CEO of the company who I met through my PhD program because we were doing, we were the same year for yeah. the PhD program at Stanford. Neil did the undergrad the first time and then went to do options trading um, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But he, rather than like reading the stuff he was supposed to be reading to actually be good at his job, he was reading startup literature like Paul Graham essays, etc. Paul Graham essays. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he's had his dreams since like 2010. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I think one of the things he learned from all the startup literature is he should have some technical skills, like mm. the ability to actually build mm. some of his stuff, some of his stuff, right? Which is why he went back to do a second bachelor's in an engineering discipline. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, that's why he's a little bit older than um, my other co-founders and myself. So Niels wanted to build a startup since like forever. And then I think David and I we're also like thinking about it. The three of us took actually a bunch of business courses while we were at Stanford as well. And then going into the last year of our PhDs, Neil, Neil brought all three of us together and was like, yo, let's just work out some stuff like on the side. You know, we're all doing PhDs in machine learning. Surely there's some way to package all of this <laughs> to create value in the world, right? So yeah, that's kind of how that happened. And um, as we started building together, working on side projects and actually making like meaningful progress i think every week uh we started doing things like we took yc startup school mm -hmm. uh, it was um an online mooc mm -hmm. and that kind of forced us to make weekly progress and then halfway through that course they told us that they were going to evaluate the companies because they were going to choose a hundred of the fifteen thousand companies in the program to Aww. give ten thousand dollar checks to and we we're like yeah that sounds pretty good nice and the way they were going to evaluate these companies actually was they were going to use the YC application because uh -huh. the YC application has been like refined over and over yeah. again to really distill down like the most important questions to ask when you're when you're like assessing or creating a company. Um, so we filled that application out and we realized, hey, even though we're filling this out for the purpose of winning this like $10,000, we're like, 
literally filling out the YC application so we should just apply to YC and see what happens. So then we did, and by some miracle, I don't know, we got in. <laughs> we like, okay, we by some miracle? By some miracle. Four PhDs or three PhDs <laughs> yeah, in the master's yeah, yeah, from yeah. Stanford. <laughs> yeah, so, something like that. But yeah, and then after we got in, we decided to give the CEO a real shot. So and the thing at the time was like a, a camera or something. Like, it, was it was very like, different. Yeah, right? it was a hardware product. Like, um, when we interviewed with, with YC, it was six months before the program actually started. They were... They were trying this oh, early acceptance okay. thing. Yeah, I think historically uh -huh. YC would interview you like maybe, like a couple months before the program. Yeah, or well, like yeah. a couple weeks before the program started. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they were trying this early decision thing where you could interview in December um, for the batch in summer. I think it was to to um, you know accommodate students more, yeah. right? So we interviewed in December for the summer twenty nineteen batch, mm -hmm. and when we interviewed, it was with a completely different product. It was a mm -hmm. uh, Face ID for doors is the pitch. <laughs> and the vision was like a, a world with no more keys, key cards, and passcodes. And then our um, we, we had to go to this demo. It was like a piece of wood with an August <laughs> smart lock on it and like a Raspberry Pi with a very simple face detection algorithm and a camera. And then we uploaded all the YC partners' faces onto the <laughs> Raspberry Pi. So then for our interview, like part of it was a demo where we like, held this piece of wood in front of... And it would open the lock for his yeah, yeah. partner. There was actually a screen that first showed that the um, the Raspberry Pi identified the faces, mm -hmm. and then it drew like a green square around the face that it detected as like has access, and then the, the door unlocked it. It was kind of cool, but it was a very, very different product from what we're working on now. So yeah. once you guys got actually, start, actually started the program in summer of 2019, were you still working on the door uh, yeah. face ID or have you already pivoted? Yeah, we, we already pivoted a few times. So yeah, oh, I guess, a few times, okay. Yeah, so I guess between like applying for YC in December of mm -hmm. 2018 to when YC actually started in, some, in summer of 2019, we took a course called Lean Launchpad, mm -hmm. which forced you to talk to like at least 12 customers every single week, right? Like it doesn't, it was focused more on talking to users rather than building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would have a product. Which is super helpful. Always talk to your yeah, users, right? it's like super helpful. Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Like trying to talk to as many users as yeah. possible. Yeah, it's, it's super important because I think especially as engineers, you fall into what's comfortable or what yeah. you have a natural affinity for, which is actually like building building mm -hmm. stuff. The, the harder question is, does the stuff that you're thinking of building actually matter? And it turns out you don't need to build that much to actually answer that harder yeah. question. Like you just go to the people that you think would get value out of what you're going to build and ask them, like, mm -hmm. if I can snap my fingers and, you know, give you this, this magical, like, thing. magical <laughs> thing, would you, would you buy it? Like, do yeah. you care? I mean, you have to phrase your questions in a more nuanced way so that they can actually give you honest answers. The mom test. The mom test. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> a great example. Yeah. And, and we did that, like, every single week. And very quickly we realized, hey, this space ID for doors thing isn't, isn't going to work. And then by the end of the course, we were thinking of like going to the productivity tool space. The idea is we're going to use machine learning to make even more productive productivity <laughs> tools. More productive productivity. <laughs> yeah. 10x productive. It's going to make everyone so productive. Um, I think like at some point we're thinking of building smart Trello or smart Asana. <laughs> the idea is like when you create a task, we'll use machine learning to yeah, yeah. surface all the relevant existing tasks so you're not repeating work, so you know who to talk to in the organization. That so sounds just, pretty useful. Yeah, it does, right? I yeah. Think, I think the the problem at that big levels a lot of people resonated with, but mm -hmm. it was really hard figuring out what the actual product yeah. like manifestation of that solution was gonna be. And also like we weren't we weren't like front end engineers, so mm -hmm. we couldn't and, and I think building a productivity tool is very front end. Heavy. Yeah, you have to have like really great crisp UX and yeah, 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 exactly. We were working on that by the time we got into YC and we went through like Few different iterations mm -hmm. of what a machine learning powered productivity tool yeah. could look like, and none of it really stuck. So, halfway through YC, we pivoted to the creator space. So, it sounds like at the beginning you were trying to hit a nail with this hammer called machine learning. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then you like went in a completely different direction, yeah. but you maintained dot AI yeah. as beacon right. right. <laughs> domain yeah. just to showcase that you're still like kind of in the machine yeah, learning. Yeah, yeah. It was actually a really Maybe like a stroke of luck that our company was called Beacons. So we haven't changed the name at all through all these different pivots. Oh, wow. Yeah, so the nice thing about the term Beacons um, is it's like kind of generic, but it yeah. has a positive connotation. And you can imagine like for a productivity tool or for like yeah. Face ID for doors, 
Um, Deacons could have worked, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, so I'm curious to take a step back a little more. Yeah. Like when you were doing your PhD uh, in electrical engineering, what was your vision for what you were going to do out of school? So it sounds like, yeah. yeah, you thought startups were cool, but you almost like fell into it because yeah. of your friends. Yes. Um, what, 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 what did you imagine yourself doing? I actually, I'm like the kind of guy who has like a rough plan of where I want to be in five years, but I don't yeah. really follow that plan at all. Like when I got to Silicon Valley, I wasn't planning on doing a PhD. Um, <laughs> I, I feel just, just you have like one of the most amount of like send it, go with yeah, the flow, yeah. which I love. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know, like if you just take a few, go a few years back, like when I got to undergrad, I was going to be a bio major and I oh. wanted to like be a doctor, like a real medical doctor, not like a, like, like a fake PhD doctor. <laughs> and then um, I didn't know what engineering was. So when, so I discovered what engineering was in my freshman year, switched to engineering, um, and then decided, hey, I actually really like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to go be an engineer. Um, apparently this is a place called Silicon Valley, where like the best <laughs> engineers in the world is do cutting edge machine learning, sorry, just cutting edge in engineering, right? How do I get to Silicon Valley? Uh, well, I don't know anyone there. I'll just apply to grad school there. Yeah. I don't really want to do a master's because mm -hmm. I don't really want to pay for that. So I'll, I'll only apply to PhD programs and maybe wow. drop out if I don't like it. At least it gets paid for. My PhD project ended up being pretty interesting, so I ended <laughs> up finishing it. So everything was like, there was like a, some, some kind of plan, but mm -hmm. um, it was never like I'm going to do apps and like stick to it and it's yeah. going to be this very specific thing yeah the idea is like if i get new information um i don't need to stick with my original plan right mm -hmm. i can kind of just like follow i don't know yeah like, whatever is drawing me in basically mm -hmm. so when i got to stanford i wasn't planning on even finishing my phd potentially there was like a, maybe a 50 percent chance i was going to finish it um did, was pretty sure i did not want to go into academia yeah i was pretty sure i wanted to go into mm -hmm. industry because i think at that time i was very like uh, I was like romanticizing the idea of working in big tech right free food like I, I, would, I remember visiting Facebook's <laughs> campus the first time and being like holy cow it was just it was just insane um so the idea of working for like one of those big tech companies with all its perks while doing like really cool work was like the ultimate goal but yeah as as I went through my PhD I realized that there was more to life than free food at <laughs> <laughs> you can have free food at vegans <laughs> I know, it's just free though. Yeah. gotcha yeah. that's awesome so yeah. um now to get to 2023 so yeah. you guys did that pivot to creator space while you were in yc and then discovered the lincoln bio wedge like that yeah. space was pretty um, fresh and new at the time, right? I guess like Linktree was the only product on the market yeah. and then Beacon started quickly growing and then four years later now you're a Series A company having raised like over 20 million dollars with yeah. Chainsmokers, A16Z, yada yada yada. Um, so, you know, you've like the founder's journey really accelerated over time. You guys have over a million users now or, or probably even more. Um, yeah. So it changed a ton, right? Yeah. Um, how yeah. has it evolved in your own eyes? Like you were this, you know, kid or whatever in YC, yeah. like trying to figure out what's up, and now you're running yeah. 35 people or something along those lines uh, team. Well, I don't even know where to start. Um, for sure, there's been a lot of evolution. I think especially for me and my role, like chief product officer, like what, what does that even mean, right? I'm, I'm still kind of figuring this out. Every few months, my responsibility and my my responsibilities and my role kind of evolves i think like four years ago when we first started i was actually my title was chief scientist or chief scientific officer because we really wanted to signal to the world that we were going to do cutting edge like machine learning <laughs> but kind of like you said we were we were like we had this giant machine learning hammer we were looking for nails to hit and we went through this loop where like we would find a nail to hit and then ask wait like what is the best way to actually solve this problem? And then it actually often wasn't <laughs> machine learning. So yeah, that's when we ended up on influencer, like the influencer slash content creator space, um, we realized that, hey, there's not gonna be a lot of machine learning applications for a little while if we actually wanna solve like real problems that these content creators have. I think at that time I shifted more from chief scientist duties, mm -hmm. whatever that meant, to just like general product duties, right? Like product is pretty broad, but someone wants to define it to me as product being that which fills the space between like the business, the user and the builder. So whatever you're lacking in one of those three axes or like legs of the 
tripod or whatever, you have to like podcast and make up for it, right? So at first we didn't have enough builders. So I was doing more like engineering work. And then at some other point, it became more important for me to do like some analytics work or some marketing work. I was like running on social media for a little bit, doing some like build hacking for a little bit, doing a bunch of data analysis for a little bit. I was like mm-hmm. very mediocre or less than mediocre at a lot of these things, but it, it just had to get done by yeah. someone, right? So then naturally, I think I became chief product officer. So four years ago, a lot of IC work. Sometime in the middle, as we started growing, actually, I guess from year like one to three, or maybe one to two and a half, most of the work there was IC work and figuring out how to work with my co-founders. And that was really, really tough, but really rewarding too, now that we've come out the other side. Because we were all transitioning from PhD students, which is like arguably the most independent line of work, mm-hmm. to being put in this situation where we were dependent on each other's work every single day. And uh, none of us have really worked like a real job except for Neil. He was in like a completely different industry and like a completely different time. Just like, it sounds kind of silly now, but we just had a lot of communication issues, just aligning on what we should work on and why and what it meant for a piece of work to be done or what it meant for a piece of work to be good. Yeah, there was just a lot of misalignments at first. Just like the meta, a lot of meta conversations about the company, like whether or not we should set goals, what good goals even were, how often we should change them. Like what, what, what we were even trying to do. I feel like every few days we had essentially a group therapy session where we started.